This week, we're looking at Kickstarter regrets based on a question from tabletop bellhop patron, Duran Barnett. Duran writes, Kickstarter regrets? Which Kickstarters do you wish you hadn't backed? Which Kickstarters do you wish you had backed and why? Well, Duran and everyone else, the thing with Kickstarter is that no matter what, you're taking a chance. No matter how reputable the creator is, no matter how many previous projects they've created, no matter if the game is already finished or just getting started, there is zero, zilch, no guarantee that you are actually going to get what you paid for. There's also no guarantee that if you do get what you paid for, it's going to be worth what you paid. It may be that the game just isn't as good as you hoped or the component quality isn't what was expected, or the game went on sale on Amazon for half the price you paid before your Kickstarter copy even showed up. Now, pretty much all of those things have happened to me. Today, I'm gonna to talk about some of the worst. I've got a project that I spent money on and got nothing for. I've got a project where, while it showed up, wasn't anywhere near what was promised on Kickstarter. And I've got a project I would have never gotten had I not fought for it. So first up, a project that never delivered. Thankfully, I only have one of these, even with all the projects I've backed. That project was Labyrinths. Labyrinths with a S, uh, plural. Customized Modular Dungeon Terrain. This was from Iron Ring Games. This was a project for Dwarven Forge style dungeon terrain. While not cheap, it was much more affordable than Dwarven Forge. And I've gotta say, all the signs were that this was a solid, legit, project. Even after the project ended, there was tons of communication, there were progress photos. It all looked pretty good at first. Soon enough, bad news updates started to come. Iron Ring was in over their head. The Kickstarter was too successful. There were too many orders to fulfill. While trying to rush and fulfill these orders, they damaged one of their critical molds. Backers were starting to get upset and things turned rather nasty in the updates. It wasn't long after that, Iron Rain declared bankruptcy. Very shortly after that, in a matter of days, they vanished. They weren't on the web anymore, there was no web page, no more updates, email addresses bounced, Twitter accounts just stopped. They vanished completely. And so did my money. Now, I have a project that didn't live up to expectations. This was Torn Armor from Alyssa Faden. I really believed in this project, so much so that I agreed to work for them. Full disclosure here, I was paid by Alyssa to help promote the project. Something I did. I talked about this project everywhere. I did everything I could to help this project fund. Heck, I even backed the project myself because I really thought it was worth it. And I didn't back at a small level. Torn Armor was supposed to be a miniature battle game with some of the most fantastic miniatures I've ever seen designed. Really unique looking stuff that was a mix of anthropomorphic fantasy on one side and steampunk Romans on the other. Now, for me, this project was not about the game itself. Same for many other people. It was all about the miniatures. Now, the problem is, all that anyone got was the game. No one ever received any miniatures. The updates are filled with tales of woe about what happened, issues with sculptors, issues with the company hired to make the minis, and lots of speculation out there about what happened and whose fault it was, and I'm not going to get into all that. Now I do have a copy of Torn Armor. It's downstairs with the rest of my games. It's in a box with uh, fold out maps, custom dice, a rule book, and some cardboard standees for the basic units in the games. The thing is, I never really wanted the game. I just wanted the minis. Now, interestingly, Sean, my podcast co-host, managed to find a more recent Kickstarter where Impact Miniatures had purchased the rights to minis from old failed Kickstarter projects, and Torn Armor was one of those. Though for me, at this point, I've spent enough money on that game. I'll pass. Now, here's a project I had to fight for. This was Mobile Frame Zero, uh, aka MF Zero. This is a really cool sounding miniature battle game that uses mecha built out of building blocks like Lego. By using building blocks, they were able to have some really cool rules for things like mechs losing their limbs and destructible terrain. Now, not only did the game sound great, I got my book. The thing is, like Torn Armor, I didn't back just for that rule book. In one of the many updates, when the project was struggling to fund, they said, hey, if we get 
X money, we're going to also release a role-playing game set in the same setting. Now that's what got me to back. Not only would I get a cool mecha game, I would also get an indie RPG in the same setting. While it was rather late, I got my Mobile Frame Zero rulebook. I read it. It was exactly as promised. Nice book. They did a great job on it. But months went by and I heard nothing about the RPG. I admit, even I forgot about it until something had me looking through my old Kickstarter history and I was like, hey, I never did get that Mobile Frame RPG. Now this led me to a ton of back and forth with uh, Joshua Newman, the project owner. Uh, I'm not going to get into it here. You can listen to the full podcast for all the details. But what matters is that I did eventually get a Mobile Frame Zero RPG, though it took four years and I had to fight for it. Now enough about projects I didn't back. How about some I wish I had? First up is the new Conan game from Asmodee. I bought the retail version of this and really digged it. I liked what I looked, and after the fact, I went and looked at what I would have got if I backed the Kickstarter, and I gotta say, I had some immediate regrets. Three times the miniatures, double the maps, upgraded components, extra scenarios, and even more. And the price difference was $40 more than what I paid in retail. That hurt a bit. Up next is Vinhos Deluxe. This is similar to Conan in the fact that there were a bunch of really great component upgrades and extra modules you could get for the game that were Kickstarter exclusives. Stuff you just can't get on the retail market. And I feel I missed out. Now the last game that I regret not backing is Seventh Continent. Now this game was 100% Kickstarter exclusive. And I gotta say, it seems like everyone is raving about this game. It shows up on best co-op lists, best solo game lists. I don't think a week has gone by where I haven't heard the game mentioned at least once on a blog or a podcast. The thing is, you just can't get it. The only option I have now is to wait for another Kickstarter reprinting it or pay crazy prices on the secondary market, and no thank you to that. So those are my Kickstarter regrets. If you're curious to hear more about these games and my regrets, be sure to check out the full podcast of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 33, either right here on YouTube or on your favorite podcatcher. I would like to take a quick moment to thank our new sponsor, Quiver Time makers of the Quiver Deluxe Card Carrying Case, and other premium card game protection items. Head over to quivertime.com slash bellhop and use the code ding ding to get 10% off their entire catalog. Time for a weekly Gloomhaven update. We had the whole team back together again and we were able to continue our campaign. This week our party took on scenario 14, The Frozen Hollow. One change this week is that we did not start our game in Gloomhaven. Now this was a direct result of Sean and I reviewing the FAQ the week previous. It ends up you only get to do the Gloomhaven stuff when you finish a campaign mission. Not random dungeons or any form of casual play. So this game started right off in the dungeon. Now Frozen Hollow went really well. We decided to go at it at normal difficulty, which for our group is now scenario level 3. This is only our second time doing an actual scenario at normal difficulty as we found early in the campaign that with four players, we were failing way too often at normal difficulty, so we were playing on easy. Now our last few games, though, seem to be a bit too easy, both, I think, as a combination of our characters improving as they leveled up, as well as us playing better as a group, so we felt confident trying at normal difficulty. Now at first, the dungeon seemed rather easy, probably a bit too easy, and there was a reason for that. When we got to the final room, I grabbed the scenario book, expecting to read a room description, like when you open one of the doors and there's a scenario number. Instead, I found a scenario effect. Now, why this wasn't listed right at the start of the scenario, I have no idea. Like, I was trying not to spoil anything and read ahead. And pretty much every scenario we've had so far has something you need to read when you open that final door, so I thought that's what this was. Instead, it was something we should have applied the entire scenario. Yet another editing and clarity issue in Gloomhaven. They seem to be mounting up. So we applied this new scenario effect in the final room and managed to still win pretty easily. No one ended up exhausted, though I will admit I was down to my last card. And we managed to snag the treasure and complete the scenario. But it felt like a hollow victory due to missing that scenario effect. Overall, it's becoming really difficult to balance 
uh, what to read and what not to read, because I don't want to spoil anything for myself or the other players. But on the other hand, I really don't want to miss things, like a scenario effect buried nine paragraphs into a scenario description. So next week, uh, our game will start in Gloomhaven, as we just finished a campaign mission, and we're going to finally get to play with the power of enchanting. Now remember, we record all of our Gloomhaven plays, and you can watch them right here on YouTube. Just check out our Gloomhaven playlist, and be sure to join us every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And you can watch us play live and point out when we do things like miss scenario effects. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that hit our tabletops in the last week. Now at first for me is Master of Orion, the board game. Like many geeks, I love the PC game Master of Orion. I love Moo 2 even more. It's up there with the best PC games of all time. Now Master of Orion is a huge 4X sci-fi game. This board game tries to recreate that in a quick filler card game. See, that's where the problem comes in. Moo was a game you played for hours, if not days. It was epic. You grew your civilization from one planet and took over an entire galaxy. Now trying to cram all that into a half hour to hour game just doesn't feel right. Now that said, this game is actually really good. It's a great quick sci-fi card game. Like it reminds me a good of games like Race for the Galaxy or Core Worlds, but much quicker than Core Worlds. If you ignore the fact that the name on the box is Master of Orion, I find a lot to like in this game. Now up next is The Ninth World, a skill building game for Numenera. Now this is an odd game. It's a unique mash of mechanics that don't quite fit and it's not quite like anything else I own. And I've got a spot spot for unique games. Now in the ninth world, players pick a character and as a group, pick a region of the map you want to explore. You lay out five destination cards representing interesting sites in those regions. And each round your party moves through them to a new spot and goes through a series of actions. First players can scout the area. Then they tinker with ciphers and oddities. Up next comes charming allies and starting quests. Combat follows this, and in the final phase, fair characters get a chance to focus, improving their skills. Now the funky part is that all of these phases are driven by auctions. Each round, players blind bid skill cards. The winner of the bid gets to go first each segment and spend a number of points they use to bid to do stuff. Now most of this is done to either defeat cards in a tableau, or collect them for your own player area. These earn the player val uh, Valor points, and player with the most Valor wins at the end of the game. It's a really unique game that you really need to play uh, to see and play to fully grok it. Now at this point I've only played once, but I will say it's enough to tell me the game's unique, and I dig unique. Now another game I got in this past week was Sagrada, the dice drafting stained glass window building game. Now the more I play Sagrada, the more I enjoy it. I love the way the game is variable due to the fact that the scoring system is randomly generated each game. That keeps having me come back for more. Now the last game I got to the table this week was Villages of Valeria, both with monuments and guild hall expansions added in. I originally talked about those back in February. Now this was a learning game for one of the players, and I'm pleased to say I didn't feel any need to pull the expansion cards out in order to keep the game simple. While they do add complexity to the game, it's nothing an experienced gamer would be overwhelmed with. I like having to not sort my cards before I start. Now I'm enjoying Villages of Valeria more and more each time I play it. Most of the expansion material is seamless. You don't even really notice the new cards. They just get mashed in with everything else. Now Monuments, on the other hand, does kind of stick out, but it was interesting to see that they had a very different role in the game than they did in previous plays, which to me is a good thing. Now Sean, my podcast co-host, noted he got in a terrible game of Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, from what he said, it was a total rout in which they ended up calling the game before it finished as there was no hope of winning. I gotta say, it's not something I expect to see from a game aimed at kids. I was disappointed to hear this. Now he also tried something new with his growing collection of DC deck building cards. And that was to try the solo rules that came in the Crisis expansion. From what he explained, there are two ways to play solo. One where you control two heroes, that's from the base game, and a new set of rules from Crisis that lets you try to challenge villains with only one hero. Now he tried that new variant and seemed to really enjoy it. He did note though he found it rather easily. 
Now, thankfully, the game includes a way to ramp up the difficulty, so the next time he goes for a solo play, he's going to try it on a harder difficulty. As usual, this weekly look back only scratches the surface. For more discussion about these games, be sure to check out the full podcast when it goes live Tuesday morning at 2 a.m. Eastern, both right here on YouTube and on your favorite podcatcher. We are here to answer your questions. Do you have a gaming or game night question you would like us to tackle in a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the website, tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now remember, we record a new episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live every Wednesday right at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. It would be awesome if you joined us on Twitch in the lobby, our live chat room. Now, if you've been enjoying the content we're providing, it would be fantastic if you would consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Express Check-In. You can always find us across the web and social media at tabletop bellhop one word, or drop by our website, tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here, and check out our latest video over here. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night and game on.